Hi everyone, and welcome to the first talk of Pi Data Yerevan. As Abed said, I'm Arman, and I'll be speaking about data standardization, the what, the why, and the how. So let's get started. Okay, so um, uh, let's look at what's on the menu for today. Um, so first, we will talk about the context of the problem. So data standardization is pretty vague and it could mean a lot of things for a lot of different contexts. So at first we will nail down the a problem context in which we're talking about data standardization. Then we will talk about what what is data standardization itself and why should we standardize the data and most importantly how to do it. Okay, so the context. Uh, a lot of businesses, especially the ones that were created during the tech boom of 2000s and 2010s, uh, the approach there was to rush to solve short-term customer problems as fast as you can, as good as you can. And uh, in the process, uh, the businesses didn't prioritize right data collection and ended up having insufficient data to innovate further. So what, what should we do then? Um, yeah, so let's uh, probably define like what it is insufficient data. Consider an e-commerce website uh, where data comes in. It's a marketplace where there are buyers and there are sellers, and the data comes in from a lot of different users, a lot of different sources. And as you could imagine, like the same product could be named in a lot of different ways. For example, like there's a website that sells home appliances and there's a fridge and there's a refrigerator, which both mean the same thing, but they are written differently, they're spelled differently. And if you'd like to calculate the distance between them using like naive string distance algorithms like Levenstein distance, you wouldn't have much luck because these two are very far apart from each other in terms of the symbols, in terms of the characters. And so there's no good way for us to understand that fridge and refrigerator actually mean the same thing. And if it's just a marketplace and you just upload your items to sell, you won't be able to scale a lot. And we'll see why. And how to deal with this problem? The solution is to standardize the data. So what is data standardization? Uh, this definition, I've come up with it. Feel free to comment if you think this is incomplete. But data standardization, for me, is, at least, is the process of cleaning and storing data in a way that would be consistent across all data sources. So wherever the data comes in from, it should be consistent and should have consistent representation everywhere. Okay, let's take a look at this example. Um, here, to the right, in the screenshot, you will see the fourth most visited website and the largest online marketplace in Armenia. And this screenshot is actually the search result of the search query of an uh, iPhone. And you can see that when we're looking for an iPhone, we get a lot of irrelevant stuff as well. Like there is an iPhone charging brick, there's an iPhone screen, and there's also whatever that Apple iPhone iCloud is supposed to be. Uh, yeah, and now I'm looking for an iPhone and I'm presented with this um, I, irrelevant uh, items to me. And it's for me as a user, it is hard to find and filter what I'm looking for. So if I'm looking for an iPhone, I have to scroll through hundreds of pages to actually get some quality results for me to be able to compare. So there's no ranking to the search here because the website itself doesn't know what is an iPhone and what isn't an iPhone, what is it just an accessory. So there's no ranking and of course to me as a user, I'd like to understand if I'm buying something, maybe I want to know the price range or who are the sellers, where they're located. And again, I can't do that because the products are scattered across hundreds of pages and to me, it would be a very hard exercise to go through every single one of those pages, document everything, maybe drop it in an Excel sheet for me then to be able to compare. Um, yeah, and if you think this example of an iPhone is bad, just take a look at this one. So this is for the car parts, and this is the search result for a uh, term bumper guard, but in Armenian we call it zashitnik, which is, yeah, of course a Russian word, but all the Armenian car part names are in Russian, so yeah. And you may see that when we're looking for a bumper guard in this website, we find um, 
a lot of weird things like a uh, car trunk nickel, which is definitely not the bumper card. And when we are asked the question, why do we see this when we search for a bumper card? We noticed that a lot of like this seller has actually put a lot of keywords that um, are irrelevant to this part that they are selling, but these are just uh, different car parts. So they do this to bump up their items in the search. So they are trying to hack the system and actually get better listings so to get better customers. And this is an example of how this poor user experience can lead to people doing this kind of hacks. And of course, as a data collector, it spoils the data because to the car trunk nickel, there is attached like a lot of this different irrelevant data. So um, if at some point we'd like to standardize this data, there is two ways to do it. So let's say the business solved the short-term customer problem and now they're, they've hit the plateau and now they can't scale. What should they do? Uh, of course, they could change the uh, software in a way that wouldn't allow this uh, craziness to happen, that wouldn't allow people to put everything and anything that they want. And that is the forward-looking type of standardization where they introduce some taxonomy to their software, to their website, uh, what not. So here we can see that um, this website that I just showed examples from actually at some point tried to make this. So there's taxonomy. So for example, for an iPhone, there is just a make, condition, color, all these attributes that they've added so that it'll be easier for users to browse. But then let's say you're at a point where you are putting these changes in your software. But what to do with the data that you already have? Because during, throughout the years, you have accumulated a lot of data and you need to somehow use it or wait a couple of years until this new changes, bringing new clean data so that you will be able to deliver features. But in that case, the market is not just going to sit there and wait. Your competitors are going to beat you. So you need to do this backwards uh, data standardization to, to the help of data science and machine learning. And Okay, so I think by now, just from the definition of the problem, you already probably have some sense of why we should standardize the data. So any ideas? Anyone? Filters? Yes, filters is one of them. And In order to have a better UX overall? Yes, yes. To have working models. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so all of those, uh, like uh, in some shape or form, are introduced in this pyramid of standardization, as I'd like to call it. So uh, this pyramid in concept is similar to uh, Maslow's pyramid, like the basic human needs. So at the bottom part, at the bottom layer, you have the most fundamental uh, things, and then everyone that builds on top of that has to rely on the previous layers. So what is the very first layer of standardization? It's the ability to be able to match things, match items. And uh, in this example, I'm talking about an e-commerce website, but this could be scaled to any number of systems where the data comes in from different sources. So let's say in the e-commerce case, what is the ability to match? It is uh, if we have in our database like two different items, like an iPhone 13 Pro 128 gig and Apple iPhone 13 Pro 128 GB, those two are actually the same thing. And again, through the help of naive algorithms, we can't understand that these two are the same. But if we use some, if we are able to match these two together, it'll unlock a lot of new things that we could do. And the next next thing is removing duplicates. So um, let's say we can already match and when we search for something, we don't have to scroll through a lot of pages to get what we're looking for. But instead, if we're looking for an iPhone somewhere, we will see just a single listing of an iPhone and then every offer listed under that. So for me as a user, it'll be really easy if I'm browsing for an iPhone, I'll just click on one thing and I'll see all the offers. I'll be able to compare everything, everything the information about the sellers, the prices, the reviews, and then it'll be easy for me to make a decision and buy or not to buy. <coughs> okay, so let's say we've removed duplicates. What's next? Um, it's It gives us the ability to analyze. So, uh, and uh, this analysis could come from different standpoints. Like, as a seller, 
it'll be interesting for me if I'm putting out a listing it'll be interesting for me to see like what is the average price what is the minimum price what is the maximum price for something for an item that I'm selling and again currently the customer experience is not very well uh, because we'll have to manually scroll through everything to find what uh, the price range to find what we're looking for and um, of course there's also another analytics role which is like the software creators themselves they'd also like to know like what what items are being sol sold through my website so that the website will be more tailor-made for those kind of products and maybe put more emphasis on that and again without matching and without removing duplicates we can do this analytics piece What's next is, uh, um, as suggested, the ability to build models that would predict or recommend something. So, for example, if I'm a user who's looking to buy an iPhone, it, there's a really high chance that I'm also looking for an iPhone uh, you know, screen guard and you know, a case and maybe an other Apple accessories. So it is also important to understand what item you're selling so that you will be able to provide uh, contextually correct recommendations and also make predictions about what's what's going to be bought next and finally as you've uh, seen in the screenshot uh, a couple of slides back there was no personalization to search so whenever a search is a uh, search query is submitted it just shows everyone the same thing and uh, in 2022, it is just not acceptable because everyone has their own interest and has a very small attention span. So they have to get personalized content to be to be interested to use that um, service, that website, that software more. Okay. Um, yes. Now, from this pyramid, we can see that if we solve the matching problem, which is probably the hardest one out of all of these, we will be able to solve everything else. So let's concentrate on matching itself. What is a matching? Again, in the context of um, e-commerce websites, the e-commerce websites have products that they're selling, and what is a product? It is basically a combination of three things, in general. A name, an image, and a price. So theoretically, if we were able to match all three of these components uh, to one to another, then for different products, we will be able to understand if two items are similar or different. And uh, the main topic of this, uh, I will of this talk will be I will more concentrate on the name matching piece and then also provide some resources at the end of how can the image matching and price matching be done well name matching let's formally define the problem that we're trying to solve is given a pair of product names output if they represent the same item or not uh, okay, so why is this uh, such a big challenge? Why can't we easily do it by string comparisons? We've already discussed uh, some difficulties, but here are um, like formal challenges that we will face in that process. Uh, first is different naming conventions. As said, like there are multiple ways to um, name the same thing. So for example, like here, 128 gig and 120 GB are the same thing and like there is a keyword Apple in the right example and not it doesn't exist in the left example and that is like the brand uh, brand name they are omitting brand names uh, and also another thing another challenge is that there could be synonyms that are used for example unused versus brand new which mean the same thing but again they mean something in within a context and they w without a context we just can't understand if these two are the same or not uh, another challenge is the challenge of vague titles so some sellers just list the products as like generic iPhone 13 with no specifications uh, and if we're comparing it to a very specified product uh, we will not be able to match again because we don't know if the you know, the specifications match to this vague one. Um, also, when I was uh, preparing these slides and I searched for iPhones to get the screenshot for that slide, um, I got a lot of weird priced uh, iPhones, like, you know, $100, $200, which is ridiculously low for iPhones. And it turned out that those items, those iPhones were fake. 
and they were listed under uh, under just regular iPhones. So there was no way there was nowhere that it is indicated that it is a fake product. And of course, the challenge is that um, if you haven't invested in proper data collection, you probably don't have label data, enough label data to be able to build models. Okay, what to do then? So then, in order to do any type of machine learning on this data at hand, uh, we will need this to do this five steps to generate the data set that we will build models on. So the first step is tokenization. Uh, which is given a uh, product name, try to understand what are the tokens. And we will see that this is not a trivial problem because just splitting stuff by space is not going to cut it within the context of this problem. And yeah, okay, let's say we've tokenized the data, then we will need to understand what each of the tokens are. So we will need a round of named entity recognition to understand what each part of the name means. After that, we will need to identify for each named entities their appropriate synonyms and antonyms, which I'll uh, describe and bring, bring examples of. And after that, um, to fit it into a model, we will need uh, positive examples and negative examples. So items that are similar to each other, labeled as such, and items that are different from each other, labeled as such. If we have enough of those, we can build a model and uh, get our uh, standardization results. So let's see. Again, this talk is like heavy with iPhone examples. I apologize for that. But yes, so this is a product. Can someone help me tokenize this name? Yes. Like a long iPhone 12. And uh, let's, let's tokenize the rest as well. It's Apple, iPhone. Yes, but that that is the naive approach, which could be weird because, like, for example, the keyword Sierra here doesn't really mean anything in the context of iPhones because it always appears as Sierra Blue. So the Sierra itself is not a token in itself. And, like, this 13 Pro Max also is, like, one entity. So we shouldn't treat it as three different tokens because then if we do named entity recognition, we will have to flag all of these items separately, and that's just not good. And also in the future, if we will try to learn some embeddings for this, it will not be... Um, appropriate as well because it's better to learn one embedding for the color than like two different embeddings and then do something. So yes, this is the tokenization that I've come up with. It could be argued that the 13 Pro Max should also be separated, but just for the sake of this example, let's keep it this way. And yes, uh, to be able to do this tokenization, we can use techniques such as pointwise mutual information to understand if these two tokens should appear together, and uh, if they appear together, treat it as a single token instead of two different tokens. Yes, once we do that, then we are ready for named entity recognition. Now, there are um, different approaches to this, and at the end, there are some papers linked on how you could do this. I won't dive too deep into it. I'll just say that we can, um, especially for phone-related stuff, if the data set is primarily for phones. Uh, there are a lot of data sets on the internet where each, where there is basically a dictionary of brands, dictionary of products, dictionary of models, storage, colors, everything. So the very simple way would be to just download those dictionaries and try to apply it to your data set. Just brute force apply it to see if anything like uh, matches 100%. Most of the times it'll be enough to have at least some um, small starting data set for you to be able to train this custom named entity recognition models. Okay, uh, once we have this, we need to identify synonyms. And by synonyms here, I mean that if within a name we exchange one thing with the other, the product itself won't change. So calling something uh, 120 GB versus 128 gig is it's basically the same thing, just with different name conventions. Uh, we can also think about if we're talking about shoes, for example, or anything that requires physical sizes. You know, the U.S. measures in inches and feet, and in Europe it's in centimeters and meters. So, yeah, th those things are all, could also be converted and matched together. 
And also like for the color as well, like Sierra Blue is sometimes is just referred to the blue iPhone. So the, those two are again synonyms in the context of this data set. And yeah, and the antonyms are the opposite of synonyms, um, which is um, if we change that part, the product itself will change. <clears throat> so if uh, instead of Apple we put Samsung, then it's just different brands and it's not the same product. If instead of iPhone we put you know, Galaxy S22 Ultra, it will be different product. So yeah, basically antonyms, if we are able to identify them, which again we could do through the help of um, the basic parsing of um, dictionaries that could be found um, available on the internet. Okay, once we understand these, we need to put it all together. So um, the first step here would be to search your data set for possible token matches. So you have a list of hundreds, thousands, millions of items. You just uh, try to compare uh, one, everything to each other to understand uh, if there are any possible token matches. So if like an Apple matches an Apple, if a Samsung matches to a Samsung, and uh, if enough things match, um, and there will be at least some level of matches, like no data is um, entirely dirty. There is uh, at least some level of cleanness in the data. So once you find it, uh, you need to collect all the matching pairs and form positive pairs like that. And uh, for negative pairs, it's a bit easier. So if we sample two random elements from the data set, and they don't have any token matches, which there would be a very high chance of because the probability of two things being the same item it would be very low in generic data sets like this. Yeah, th that's how we can generate the negative pairs. And for the edge cases, like the products that are uh, spelled differently but are actually the same thing, or vice versa, they are the same thing, but they are not the same thing, but the names are very close. For example, iPhone versus an iPhone case. What we can do is we can swap out tokens with their antonyms to generate negative pairs. So, for example, if we have you know an Apple iPhone something, we will swap it out with a Samsung iPhone something, and uh, we'll get negative pairs, and we can do the same with synonyms to generate positive pairs. And this will help the model to uh, see the examples where only one keyword makes all the difference um, in this matching exercise. Yeah, and uh, once we put everything together, we will end up with a data set like this, which will be enough, at least, to start building some models to see if we can... Um, you know, uh, do this matching and standardization. So the first step to building the model would be generating name embeddings. Uh, and uh, these embeddings, uh, in a lot of blog posts and papers, uh, people claim that for some, um, for some data sets, uh, basic like BERT embeddings or, uh, you know, GPD-3 based embeddings work well. Well, it depends on how common your data set is. I, for iPhones, I'm sure it'll work because iPhones appear a lot in uh, the data sets on which those big models are trained. But if you are dealing with a very niche, you know, specific data set, it'll be hard to get um, accurate and good embeddings from um, you know, the, those big models. So I would suggest just building your own name embeddings you're starting simple, like word to vec or Glove embedding should be enough to start the modeling exercise. Also, some people just train their embeddings through their, they put the embedding layer as part of the network that they're going to build. So that is also an option. And it depends on the data set. And also, it's more of like the phase where you need trial and error to understand what works well for you. OK, and now for the model itself. Um, Basically, mostly what you will see in the literature is for this kind of examples, like to understand if two texts are similar or are different. Um, it's uh, always, um, almost always use the Siamese architecture. And uh, within these branch networks, um, you will see either convolutional layers or uh, you know, recurrent, uh, recurrent layers like LSTMs. Uh, and another... Um, a example of a network that works well in these um, 
in this context is concatenating two embeddings before supplying it to the model. So instead of putting it like input one, input two separately, like it's presented here, one could concatenate the embeddings before feeding it into a model. And sometimes, in my experience at least, it works a bit better than, um, than the Siamese networks. Okay, and hopefully after this you will get high enough accuracy so that you can proceed with the other components. So what's next? Let's say you have the model. You, as um, we talked about earlier, you will need to have another model to compare images. So again, there, there are a lot of papers that um, are, are telling about how you can do that. The architecture is similar. So again, Siamese networks are used to understand the difference or similarity between two pictures. And um, then we need to do price similarity, which could um, seem like it's a trivial problem because price is the easiest to compare because it's a numerical feature and you can simply just subtract one from another to see how close or far apart they are. But again, it is very hard from the context to understand, like for an iPhone, is $100 price variance, is it, is it accurate, is it not, if, are they the same or not? And uh, for that, what we could do is when constructing the initial data set, we, um, hopefully we have at least some uh, accurate and clean matches. And through the help of that matches, we can uh, form like clusters for product prices. And then whenever a new price comes in that we would want to compare to that product price, we could treat it as um, outlier detection problem and use it uh, and solve it through hypothesis testing. Like the hypothesis would be that the, uh, the new price is an outlier and we will try to either accept it or reject it. And yeah, in the end, we just put all these three models together and we get uh, standardized data, hopefully. Yeah. Yes, that's it for the main part. I'll open it up for questions. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that, uh, as far as I understand, you just split the engines, like similar changes for images, for text, and for price. Why don't you use the clip model or something like that with the United Vector Space? So that is, again, there is a very uh, good suggestion, and I've read some papers that do that. Uh, at least for the problems that I've dealt with, I didn't have these images and other information like that, so I didn't try that. I didn't have a chance to try that. But yeah, there is some research that actually talks about that and how sometimes it is successful. Yeah, that's the probably the next sort of for the matching problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, so if, if, if everybody stands, I can ask a, sure. one more question, yeah. So uh, I just wonder, isn't it the, the, the reasonable to train the large language model on the whole sentence? So you that can add the words by the space or maybe some, uh, I don't know, united features of uh, yeah. uh, next words and stuff like that, but don't, uh, can you use the sentence piece for embed the whole sentences and then use the, solve the similarity problem? I guess that goes back to the issue of how commonly, how common is your data set? Like if it's a very niche data set that is, doesn't appear in a kind of text that those large models are trained on, you, the embeddings wouldn't mean a lot. And yeah, but I'm curious because uh, for matching problems, sometimes you have the Amazon and AliExpress and the languages are different. So uh, you cannot like obtain the, the dictionaries for the cinema, yeah. for the fire phrases for whole languages you have in, in the world. So that's why I should yeah. the sentence piece. Like yeah, yeah, that's a good point. A multi-language model like T5 and stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. It'll be also interesting to see how it plays well with those niche data sets, like if something is not very common, but also it's in different languages. Yeah, so really there are like two different problems that you will try to solve simultaneously. So yeah. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Yeah. So does that mean for uh, if you have a website in two languages, you do you have to do uh, different data sets and do the process twice, or? Uh, if we are using this, uh, you know, sequence of things, then probably yes. Yeah, uh, I can say in other cases, so it, it'll be interesting to talk about it later. But yeah. And have you tried the human markups? Uh, like you did this uh, synthetic data set, as far as I understand. Uh, 
Yes and no. So uh, for a lot of parts, like in, in the data sets at least that I work with, there is some sort of an universal identifier. Like, for example, if you're dealing with books, you have ISBN codes, which could be used to label stuff, right? So I had at least a small validation sample so that uh, whenever we build this synthetic data set, we have at least a holdout set that is uh, somewhat well more reliable than the synthetic data. So yeah, th that is how I generally did it. Uh, you mentioned three data sources, the picture, the price, and the title. But I think you, have, you haven't included the fourth, the most important data source, which is the user, which gives clicks. So if the user searches something, he clicks to stop. And those images, what uh, the user have clicked, those must be given more weight because those are the relevant information. And I think this model will be more useful to see the user, the reactions of the user, and yeah. record them. Uh, I think that would solve the search relevance problem. So through the clicks, you can understand uh, like which was more relevant for this search query. But it could also be translated into a product matching problem, but not directly. It'll be this indirect thing, like if user searches for something and then clicks on the first item and then clicks on the second, we may assume that those two yeah, are uh, similar. This fourth thing can be included in like, general model as another way, like not only uh, image matching, item matching, price matching, but also pattern matching, user pattern matching. Yeah, that's an interesting proposition. Yeah. If this problem is solvable, why is it that eBay, um, if you go and you're searching for car parts, for example, unless you filter multiple items, you're you're going to be getting a lot of terrible results. Uh, what what is that? I guess. Is it part of the strategy, maybe? Could be, could be, like, uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure, like, eBay's product managers could probably answer that question better, because, yes, there is an ability, and a lot of websites are doing this, you will see in Amazon, or in Walmart, or any other of those big retailers, where there are different sellers selling the same product, you will see that this problem is already solved. Like, in Amazon, if you're looking for an iPhone, you're not going to get 100 different of iPhones. You're just going to get one, and then this offers from different sellers, reviews, and everything. Yeah. Can you elaborate on how can we deal with the users who are trying to pay them to cheat the system? Let's say, I put a name of the product, who says iPhone 12, 13, to my iPhone 112, and... Yes. Uh, so, do you mean if something's not an iPhone, but they label it as an iPhone and a... Yeah, I see. Uh, once you... Uh, I mean, my solution to that would be if you have a model that understands that iPhone 12 is an entity on its own, and then there are like other products that my model identifies that there's a, a iPhone 12 and iPhone 13, both in the same context, then that is probably uh, not the right way. So I wouldn't let that, that kind of name to be inputted. So it'll be like a name restriction. It'll throw an error and say you can put a name like this. Yeah, if, if it's only in the database, uh, uh, we can just discard this? Yeah, and... That probably depends on the product and the use case. So I can say one would be better than the other. If you are just on the back end training stuff, you can easily discard and just keep the one that is that appears most time. So if the name and the description match with something and that the description contains a whole lot of other names, you would probably keep the one that matches and then throw out the rest. But that could be one approach. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Thanks. And here at the end, I have some links that uh, could be relevant. So I'm not sure. Will this presentation be shared with the group? Yes. If yes. Share it on the uh, meetup page. Yeah. Okay. Great. Then yeah, these references you can go take a look, and.
Thank you.